Hello, everyone. This is Oran. I'm an educator of philosophy based in Austin, Texas. Today, I will have a brilliant conversation with my great friend, Tren. Hello, Tren. Hi, everybody. Uh, this is Tren. I'm a uh, cultural historian of early middle of Europe and the late middle of China. Normally, I'm based in Austin, Texas, just like Oran is. Uh, but right now, I'm doing archive in Paris. It's good to be with you, Oran. Great to be with you. So what we are going to do is that we're going to do a, a short summary of what we discussed in the last two episodes of this um, new series in our conversations. And then we will talk about a very important layer um, of Hegel's logic, um, a, a big concern about Hegel's logic as a whole. But Trent, could you give us uh, an idea of what we're talking about and where we are headed? Yeah, sure, uh, willingly. I for for the past two episodes, uh, Onana, I basically introduced ourselves as well as our listeners to a fairly long project that we're doing. That is that uh, Hegel's a science of logic. That's the main text that we'll be reading. But we are not reading it um, without any reference. Like uh, we, we, after our discussion, we chose um, Hogate's book, The Opening of Hegel's Logic, as kind of guide towards the perplexity. But the, 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 the end goal is to understand of Hegel's main text, his own text, better. So for the past uh, two episodes, we set the scene, basically, to put Hegel in the history of Western philosophy or his philosophy in general uh, through contrasting his ideas with uh, preceding philosophers, primarily um, Henri Descartes and Immanuel Kant, to highlight the radical nature or the um, creativity or originality of his project of logic. So how do we mean with the um, radicality of his, his project? It starts at the very beginning, basically from the first line of that. Whenever you are picking up his book, you will realize that uh, unlike his predecessors, that Hegel proposed to have a different foundation for a philosophical enterprise. Instead of being certain about any preposition or anything, he suggested the readers to throw all, them, all of them away, to empty their mind, basically, to have a presuppositionless beginning. So that leads to the main topic today. So what are the reactions or intuitive reaction to a certain extent um, towards this radical proposition that a decent radical examination of thinking and being itself must be presuppositionless. And um, as we mentioned in the final um, slide of the previous episode, that uh, there are three we summarized um, possible or predominant reaction to this project, which without in its lack of um, reception person to a certain extent in our time, that is the impossible, the meaningless, and useless. Could you take us from there, Aran, and um, tell us that what is impossible um, in Hegel's project, as people may deem? Yes. So as you said, uh, the energy behind uh, Hegel's project is something that is actually very familiar in the uh, post uh, enlightenment uh, thinking of European philosophy, and also uh, in, in an interesting way connected to the ancient skepticism of the Greeks. And that idea is how far we can go in suspending presuppositions and uh, that skeptical energy of uh, philosophy, how it could be maximized. And we see that in someone like Descartes, we see that in Kant in different ways. Now, like for instance, uh, the, the difference between uh, Descartes and Hegel would be that Descartes wants to go through this kind of a skeptical project to arrive at a certain foundation. But Hegel was far more interested in a presuppo presupposition beginning than a certain foundation. That's a very important distinction that we see um, between Hegel and Descartes, and we see other differences with, uh, with Kant. That what Hegel is proposing is that 
I don't want to take anything for granted. And his charge against both Descartes and Kant is that they are taking things for granted. Now, if Hegel does not want to take anything for granted, what does that mean? And I think that's at the core of understanding Hegel's science of logic. What does it mean to take nothing for granted? Or in other words, in the language that Hegel is more interested in, what does it mean to proceed from zero presuppositions? Because we will have a problem in fulfilling this demand if we start with some presuppositions. Therefore, this project, whatever, wherever it goes and however it goes there, must start from zero presuppositions. But that sounds impossible. In what sense we can think about any sort of inquiry without presuppositions? It's It seems to be intuitively fishy. It doesn't sound like something that could actually be done. And Hegel emphasizes in, in this coach that we are bringing from encyclopedia logic that he's very much there. He's not, you know, doubling down. He's, he's, he's going to do this. He says, all presuppositions or assumptions must equally be given up when we enter into the science. They're, they, they're taken from representation or from thinking, for it's this science in which all determinations of this sort must first be investigated and in which their meaning and validity like that of their antitheses must be recognized. Science should be preceded by universal doubt, that is, by total presuppositionlessness. So there is very less, like, there's not much room to say that, ah, oh, you know, he wants these presuppositions. No, he thinks that this type of a scientific inquiry that is radical in its self-criticism cannot start from any presuppositions. Now we see that in the you know the distinction um, between um, again Descartes and Kant and Hegel and he how Hegel looks at them. What Hegel says to Descartes and Kant, other than like all sorts of localized criticism that he has against them, is that they are presupposing much, right? And that's a very interesting kind of a charge against someone like Descartes because Descartes seems to be just giving it up. Hegel does not agree. Hegel thinks that Descartes is, for instance, presupposing the distinction between subject and object. And Kant is doing that in a different way. Right. So we need to start from somewhere that doesn't look like that at all. But where is that place? Where is that place that there is no presupposition? It seems like that as soon as we think we are making distinctions and by making distinctions, we need some presuppositions. So this seems to be something that doesn't go through. Now, the reason we are distinguishing between thinking of Hegel's project as impossible, um, as opposed to like meaningless or useful, is that a person who would think of Hegel's project as impossible does not necessarily think that Hegel's project is meaningless or um, useless. Someone could say, for instance, that it would have been great if we could start from a pre presuppositionless beginning, and then we could have you know, certainty or access to truth or however you want to frame it, but we can't. So there could be, in this charge of impossibility, there could be some level of uh, you know, a sigh not a sigh of relief, but a sigh of pessimism about the possibilities of human knowledge. Now, what we want to do in this episode is to clarify what types of charges could be made against Hegel in terms of this claim of presuppositionlessness. And by clarifying that, we will be ready to formulate our response and uh, which is influenced by Holgate's response to these charges, why these charges are not, in our view, valid in the way that they pretend to be valid. They could be valid in different in a different way, but they're not 
why we think that Hegel has enough resources to answer these um, doubts about the possibility of his project. Before moving on, Trent, do you have anything to add to um, any of these points? Not really. I think the only thing I want to highlight, which is to reiterate the point you already brought into this introduction of impossibility, is impossible people we consider, or the uh, in the coming slide, we're talking about the typology of a different forms of um, categorizing Hegel's project that as impossible. Those people share the so-called philosopher's desire or Hegel's desire to rip off as many presuppositions as possible, but they, for one reason or another, um, are convinced that um, human reason is not capable of uh, reaching the absolute form Hegel desires, that is, to let the science to be guided and preceded by universal doubt, universal and total presumptionlessness. Uh, yeah, that, that's, yeah, that, that point is definitely, uh, I think, is essential for the differentiation between these different charges of the system that, as you mentioned, that there is a, the desire is there. The desire for universal doubt might be there and uh, it kind of hits something. That's the charge of impossibility. Impossibility is not saying that, oh, even if this is possible, who cares? Impossibility is to just say that, oh, it would have been good. The desire is there, but we are not um, we're not achieving that. Now, as we are moving to the typology of these um, impossibilities, it is important to make it clear that not all of these figures and characters or philosophers that we talk about, they do not necessarily think that this un universal doubt um, is valuable. But here, what we focus on is their the layer of the charge of impossibility. We're going to extensively talk about uselessness, that someone could think of this as absolutely possible, but still think of it as not worth um, pursuing. Yeah, so there's right. just one thing I would like to highlight at this moment is uh, by defending Hegel's project as a possibility, we are not saying, without even examining his attack itself, saying his project is correct. But if you subscribe to one of the three main, what we call charges against the Hegel's project, then, then the, 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 the contemporary reaction towards the Hegel's project that is ignoring it or, or not not reading it is justified. We're just saying this attitude, this um, contentness of ignoring this project is not justified because there's no easy way to pass judgment to this project without engaging with the subject. But doesn't mean we already subscribe to Hegel's um, doctrine or consider his project solid and sound. So that's a, a very important um, clarification of why we are preemptively interrogating such uh, critical views of Hegel's project. Back to your point. I think that's that's a very good point. And also it kind of reiterates what we tried to communicate in the first two episodes, that we are not quote unquote Hegelians. We are not just, uh, you know, happen to believe, like we don't have a faith in science of logic. We, and all of these points, we are, trying our best to bring science of logic to someone who doesn't really subscribe to Hegel and show that, like as Trent said, the failure of the charges of impossibility do not mean that Hegel's project is successful, but it means that if it's not successful, it's not because of the reasons of impossibility. It's, it, it must fail in a different way. And this failure, this failure that is not coming from these charges is something that we are interested in. Yeah. So um, let's start talking about some of these, these categories of these types of charges that could be uh, directed at right. and Hegel's project in the science of logic. And some of these uh, uh, ideas, some of these lines of thinking are clearly presented in 
um, oh, the opening of Hegel's logic by Stephen Holgate. Others are the ones that we came up with as we were thinking about this. Now we're going to introduce these different kind of areas and domains. And uh, per usual, we are interested to see what you guys think as well. So if you come up with another layer of the charge of impossibility that is not in any of these domains, leave a comment, let us know. Uh, this is uh, this is something that we thought as just kind of comprehensive enough in terms of the doubt. So I will start with the skeptical charge and uh, Trent could, could tell us something about the Gadamer's linguistic charge and we take it from there. So one main thing about this whole impossibility is just a very basic level skepticism. Uh, I'm, I'm using that for, for uh, lack of better terms. It's it could start from it could have a different domains, right? One of which could be like a very commonsensical kind of a shrug that uh, nothing is presuppositionless. Every doctrine must start with something, right? And uh, in more sophisticated versions of it, this could even go directed in like any sort of any attitude, any perspective is only possible if we have, if you cannot have a view unless you have taken for granted something. Right. And if no view, if there is no perspective possible without that taking for granted of something, then there is no presupposition this beginning. Now, this doesn't mean that we can not go back and look at what we have taken for granted, but no project could start from that space of lack of presuppositions. You always start somewhere. And the fact that you start somewhere and not somewhere else is just because of some presuppositions that are in place. In that sense, this charge of a skepticism would say, that this is not about Hegel's, this is not a Hegel's problem. Any sort of thinking, because it implies having a position, requires taking something for granted. So nothing could be presuppositionless in that way. Now, Gadamer's point is very different. That is not this general skeptical charge, but it's something very much related to language. Trent, do you want to tell us more about that? Yes, I just want to briefly mention that, and I probably will come back to that in the future episode, that because um, Hegel did not transmit his thought, his project to us via, I don't know, telepathy or through some mystical dance. Rather, he was using the German language as it was spoken in his area or by literary person in, of his period. And it was a human beings in communicating. We're just talking animals to, to, to a certain extent. And uh, we use we, we, our ideas that our some basic level of relationship is a, to a certain extent made explicit through our language. Perhaps in all languages, there is the negation structure. So you have like a yes, no, that kind of separation. And uh, such a thing uh, for Gautama is a kind of import from the natural language is not something derived or justified in the system just by itself. So Hegel's communication of his um, project in this sense is not possible uh, without using any natural language. And in doing so, it also automatically, according to the Gautama, filters in or inherits a certain package, could be cultural, could be relational, could be logical, that this language as a linguistic community has formed um, by the uh, speech speaker's time. So in that sense, even though Hegel is using his mind to go as far as he could, he could not reach what he's like rational thinking really tells him that he has a reach. Namely, um, he is the free from, or his project is the free from the presuppositions that are inherited to the um, German language itself. So anything you want to add to that? Yeah, I think that that's very good, but I think it's like Gadamer has an interesting point here that Hegel is doing something in logic, 
right? Hegel maybe is something doing in logic that is very significant to Gadamer, but it is significant to Germans or the German language, right? Because he thinks, as the coach uh, that we have here also shows, words, there is no beginning ex nihilo. So remember that with this whole presuppositionlessness of Hegel's project, and we add layers to this, we know that it is still obscure, but Hegel decides that the concept of being as absolute indeterminacy or absolute immediacy is this, you know, presuppositionless beginning. Now, what Gollumer tells us that there is no such a thing as an emptied out being. Being in English or being in Chinese, which we're going to talk about okay. um, next time, um, or being in Farsi or being in German, they hold different positions, right? They are, they they have a connection between, there is a connection already existing connection between um, Zion and Dasein, for instance, that might not be present in any other language. Now, Hegel might be able to kind of think through these concepts as exist in the German language, but there is no, this is very much kind of trapped in the German world, not, uh, not, not applicable. It's not, a, it's not divulging anything universal about being. It's, it might be discovering something about sein as it, exist in German, it might clarify like some, for instance, contradictions that exist in how this word was fabricated or created or used throughout times in the German language. But Hegel cannot start from just language. I think at the core of what Gadamer is telling us It is this idea of uh, that because words function in that way, because words always are embedded in a culture, universal doubt about the meaning of concepts only could go as far as universal doubt about the meaning of concepts in a language and it could, could only find its solutions with engagement with that language itself. And in that case, there is Hegel is incapable of establishing any sort of science um, that kind of like transcends differences in languages. No, Hegel was doing something important with German language, Gadamer thinks, but he definitely is not Beginning from a presupposition this position, neither can he end at some universal science of basic concepts um, that transcends languages. Yeah. Thanks for that clarification. I think that what you added is really important um, there in the sense that it introduces, I got to mention that if I understand you correctly, it's um, turning Hegel's claim of doing a um, how to put it, a uh, universal project, a project that is relevant to everybody, to a more parochialized project that is relevant to German users and that tell us the things that how German mind think instead of like how mind functions. That's what you're saying. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's it. And we see, because it has been like the beginning of our project, we see that enlightenment, counter-enlightenment energy there as well, right? Gadamer, I think, kind of locates Herder, Hegel yeah. as an enlightenment figure that wants to go to this kind of universal space, which, you know, Descartes and Kant are clear embodiments of that um, project. And Gadamer not being Haman, but like Gadamer being someone who is far more closer to Haman in this sense that... Right. You know, it's always a culture. There's always that kind of a, it's not personalized, it's not individualized, it's not necessarily skeptical in a very 
grand way, but you're always in it and it matters that you're in it. You're always in a language, you're always in a ritual system, you're always in a history and all of those things matter. And the funny part of this charge is that Hegel is usually presented as someone is a, you know, historicist. He really wants, you know, to emphasize on sociopolitical structures. And in logic, something strange happens. It seems like he's not doing that. He's going for more like an enlightenment project. And I think this itself is going to be important in our conversations throughout, um, you know, the Ferzucha project. That I think this is not this is not an accident right. that one side of Hegel has very much interest and appreciation of embeddedness and the necessity of sociopolitical structures for very basic facts of human life. Right. And at the same time, there is Hegel's logic. Right. There is no accident about this, uh, about this kind of combination of these two energies. Um, and I think Gadamer, Gadamer's view of science of logic would be something that Gadamer would have done. I'm not familiar if he has done that, but I think he would have done the same thing with Descartes, that Cogito is a, a localized right. problem. Like if you're in a, you know, in a tribe that has a no I, like it's not that's important. If it, there is a language of a Pacific Islander culture that is just absent, that concept of I is absent, then cogito doesn't mean anything. Cogito means something because it's a discovery of, uh, at best, a discovery in European Geist that for, we are. You know, we have that. That's central to us. You see what I'm saying? Like it's it's a cinch, it's a discovery of centrality of certain points within a culture instead of a universal discovery about the nature of reality. Um, so I think that's that's what uh, Godamer's charge is, and he, he because of that he thinks there is no presuppositionlessness. Right now, the yes. the two other. Um, points that we're going to make and there is something that we want to share uh, that Nes Holgate didn't, didn't mention. Uh, Holgate Nes Nes definitely mentions Kierkegaard's charge. Uh, right. And Kierkegaard is we, we, we call this the will charge. But Holgate does not directly talk about Nietzsche but I think it, it could be there. Like we could uh, find that there. So with, with Kierkegaard, the story is not that hard. The story is like, okay, Kierkegaard says, Hegel wants to abstract, right? He wants to abstract from all of these like ideas that we have about being. Like, you know, being is different from thought. Being is about being as a determinant existence of objects. Hegel wants to keep abstract, right? Like if you see an oak tree, you see like, what is this? this? Is a natural thing? What is, you know, what is it? What is what is it to be at the more abstract level? It's just like, it just is, right? Like it's just you going back from something concrete to something abstract. That's the energy that Kierkegaard recognizes in Hegel's logic. But Kierkegaard has two points. One is that, Okay, if you want to stop at the level of immediacy, that immediacy is only possible as a mediated result of the activity of abstraction, right? We are actively, that's the, that's the medium through which we arrived at the concept of immediacy. So the concept of immediacy is never, never really purely immediate because we have done this, we have done this path. And more importantly, we have decided to do that. Right. As Holgate mentions, this whole, the precondition of arriving at the immediacy is the beginning is a subjective decision by the individual. 
not an act of self-suspension by reflective thought. Is that the thought stops? The thought never stops. What it stops is me, is result, is determination, is will, is decision, is arbitrariness to just say here. That's just what, what we have. And this layer of subjectivity is something that, according to Kierkegaard, is absent um, in Hegel's story. Yes, Aron, thanks a lot for that informative, but for my mind, a little bit too abstract, this is a round down the Kierkegaard's chart, which is very abstract and complex. And I think I try to use maybe an uh, analogy or a metaphor because I am a closet electrician. And that's what I really want to do in my life, really. I think if you think like Hegel's project is a kind of like a power plant, whatever, again, and uh, most other philosophers have their power plants, but they say, okay, we have a generator of power. And that thing is our funding. Thing. That's our presupposition, whatever. And the rest, the power just come out from that movement. But, but Hegel say, actually, my thing is like self-referential, has no beginning, no end. The beginning is the end, whatever. And for Kierkegaard, he's saying, if you are making such a power plant, it by definition will have a sh short um, circuit. Because it just it goes back to the first stage you don't have a start you don't have a generator the power just like, go insane it's so directionless unless unless some mysterious like will shows up and it directed them and make it into a flow of energy is that like a uh, encapsulating what you try to um i think so present uh Kierkegaard wants to say that hegel pretends that there is only this plant right right that it is just generating on its own but it's not generating on its own there are all sorts of decisions being made and there's all sorts of inputs that are there that inputs are not necessarily a presupposition about language, but it's about human action. If I don't abstract, the thought itself does not go anywhere. Right. I have to decide to abstract. And if I don't stop, the thought doesn't stop. So this kind of a subjective presence, according to Kierkegaard, is not present in, in Hegel's story, it is hidden, it is suppressed. Right. But that is a, that would be a problem for the whole deal with presuppositionlessness uh, claim. Right. And with, with Nietzsche, I just want to mention this in general, because I think when we talk about uselessness or, you know, that general charge, that might be better. But Nietzsche tells us in Genealogy of Morals, the third essay, that there is no such a thing as science without any presuppositions. This thought does not bear thinking through. It is paralogical philosophy. A faith must always be there, first of all, so that science can acquire from it a direction, a meaning, a limit, a method, a right to exist. And here, Nietzsche is not talking about Hegel's uh, uh, science of logic. He's talking about more like modern sciences. But I think his point is, in some ways, close to Kierkegaard in the sense that uh, only if you give a damn about something mm -hmm. you can just begin right and it's it's another way to talk about this kind of resolve but it's not just resolve in in an isolated act but if you yeah if you want to go find something or if you want to discover something yeah sure but this is not a power plan that it works on its own there is there is there are all sorts of value judgments as presuppositions that, oh, like, for instance, we need to give a damn about what the meaning of basic concepts are, right? And it kind of disregards this other path that someone says that, you know what? We're actually much better off not knowing. Let's just go on the start, right? And that is a type of presupposition that is present in Hegel's project. And as we're going to talk about in the next um, episode, Hegel has no problem with accepting this presupposition, um, I think, but it seems like a presupposition. Now, with that, Shren, I want you to talk about that the last bit here that is not necessarily a charge that you had in mind, uh, but something that could be added possibly to this list of impossibilities that is going to be something that we are going to expand on 
but I think it's worthy of mentioning um, here. Do you, do you want to elaborate on that? Elaborate? Yes, um, it's more a quest. I think my, I don't want to call the following um, a charge against the system, but rather a, a curiosity or question. Because if you take any of the f previous four, maybe at least the previous three um, added towards this project, then there's really no need to 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 read like Hegel's project or logic per se. But for for to to satisfy my curiosity, which I'm about to raise in a second, reading it is necessary because it might be justified in Hegel's system. We haven't read through the whole project, so we cannot pass any judgment on that yet. My concern is what is Hegel what Hegel was doing here? He was writing a book called the Logic. And are trying to share his understanding with the people around him, and of course, he may re reach a certain say understanding of how being and the thought uh, are uh, functioning at what time, um, and it, it, in all time for that matter. And but what made the, this project um, possible is also he's able to teach other people. That is through writing this book. So what to justify this teaching? You can if you look at the history of religions, the Buddha he reached enlightenment, but he was very hesitant because he was not sure whether the Dharma was preachable at all. Maybe you can only reach that state of mind of enlightenment or have a in Hegel's case a better or correct understanding for the relation between thinking and the being or like subject and object only through that mental mental introspection or whatever, but there's no way for you to communicate it to other people. So mm -hmm. to a certain extent, I'm just questioning whether communicability is voucher safe or guaranteed or derived in this project while we're interrog interrogating the fundamental category like being itself, or is something we must assume as a preposition that Sure, we're doing this project, but this project may or may not be like understood by another person because like understanding is distorted by language, by media, like it's such communication is taking place. Um, so that's just a curiosity I have because um, I really think the core of this is connected with the universality and individuality problem we raised it in previous charges that are against the Hegel, and I. I'm personally hopeful that the Hegel has an answer to that universal um, individual relationship, which would make would make it a very good a venue or platform for us to to, to talk about um, communicability of um, Hegel's project. Yeah, I think that's that's a, a brilliant point of curiosity because I think you're right that it goes. Like the answer to that question requires an answer to the question of the relationship between universality and individuality. And in that weird way, it requires engagement with Hegel's logic because right. universality and individuality are not like assuming the distinction between the two is going to be too much right. <laughs> uh, distinction for him to begin the system with. But we know that they are going to show up um, in, in different parts of the science of logic. So yes, I I agree that in in that sense your your point is not so much about a charge, but it's more about you know a a pointer that this this needs to be addressed yes. somewhere like somewhere. Um, yes. So I think with that we have covered all the lines of uh, the charge of impossibility that we think is as significant in. Uh, Hegel's logic or against Hegel's logic we are going to end this episode here with suspension and we are going to come back to you with why we think none of these works or why none of these will change anything fundamental about the validity of Hegel's project with the acknowledgement that just because Hegel's logic is not impossible in our view, that doesn't mean it's successful. What is important that it's possible 
failure is not because it is impossible. Indeed, indeed. So thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.